Welcome to the New Rules Summit. I'm Meredith Covet Levy, and I'm the COO of the New York Times. We are so, so happy to have you all here um, for our pre conference panel on a topic that I am incredibly excited to talk about inclusive AI. Um, I want to say a couple of things just because I realize for most of you this is the beginning of the summit. So let me just take a minute and say the summit itself. How many of you were here last year? Oh, so great. Return guests. So those of you who are not here realize this is a good program. Um, this has been a complete labor of love uh, by many people, but particularly women at the New York Times. We are so happy to, um, to be doing our, our second summit, and we're incredibly grateful um, to the team at IBM, two of whom I have on the panel. The summit would not be possible without them, um, and we are really excited to begin a, in a conversation with them. I'm thrilled that we're starting with AI. Um, we are here over the next day and a half to talk about change, and it's hard to imagine there is a single thing or force or happening in the world um, that will create more change to the way everything works than AI is doing. We know that's the case in business. Something like 80% of all companies are either already engaging in AI in a meaningful way or they're contemplating it. And nearly every company, every corporate leader says AI is going to be critical to their, their competitive advantage. So what does that mean? It means we've got to really contemplate how to implement AI responsibly, and how to do it in an inclusive way. And here to talk about that, I have four genuine experts. I want to start all the way to my left um, with the person who may be working in AI the longest. Uh, Francesca Rossi is the head of AI ethics um, at IBM, which is a giant job. Lots to hear from her. She's the global leader um, of that. And she has also been the president, I think just now the past president of the International Joint Conference on AI and has been a leading figure in sort of shaping the way we think about AI and its influence on society. Um, next to Francesca, we have Sircon Piantino. I think this is Sircon's second appearance at a New York Times conference. Um, Sircon uh, spent a number of years, I think he just told me, 12 years at Facebook, where he led AI research, and he has just now started his own company, or in the last couple of years, which is called Spell. He's the founder and CEO, and it's essentially about making AI accessible in all of the places that it should be. So uh, welcome, Sir Khan. Um, to Sir Khan's right is Rashida Hodge, who is now the VP at IBM of Global Markets their insurance practice, but before that, she was in charge of strategic partnerships for Watson. I think in many ways, Watson was many of our introduction to AI, at least our, our sort of consumer-oriented introduction to it. Um, and she spent a lot of time working with clients in their implementation of AI through Watson and through IBM Solutions. And that brings me to Marianne Fleming, who was a client, is a client. Um, Marianne is the head of home buying and ownership services at the Royal Bank of Scotland, where she is actually using IBM technology in her daily work. And I think she describes it as using IBM AI to make a 300-year-old company incredibly modern <laughs> in all that it does. So we're so happy uh, to have you all here. Francesca, I want to start with you. And what I want to ask you to do for the group is to just set the stage for us a little bit and give us a sense um, where we are in the journey in the world of AI becoming sort of a big part of our, our lives. So if, if this were you know a family trip, are we just packing the car um, or are we sort of off onto the highway? Well, we already went a long way. So <laughs> AI, far. AI has not started like five or six years ago, well, though some people may think that way because it got a lot of attention in the recent years. But AI has been around since, uh, I mean, the term was started being used in 1956, so it has more than 60 years. Um, and uh, uh, 
AI has a lot of sub-disciplines and uh, different approaches, different techniques to try to solve problems in a rational and in intelligent, whatever that means, way. Uh, some of them have to do with really human beings coding the uh, kind of the, the sequence of steps to be solving problems, and that is called kind of symbolic and uh, uh, reasoning kind of AI. Uh, but then there are these other approaches that are more data driven that uh, basically allow AI to solve problems that are not, if we cannot define very well, uh, but uh, so we cannot really give the sequence of instruction to solve the problem. So what we do, we give a lot of examples on how to solve a problem. And then the, the machine extrapolates from these examples, generalizes uh, so that it behaves well also in situations that are not the examples that we have given. And so this uh, approach uh, is the one that made very recently AI very successful in, uh, in being applied in many domains uh, where there are these ill-defined problems that are mostly related to perception capabilities of the AI systems, like interpreting an image or understanding, well, understanding is a big word, but interpreting <laughs> a piece of text <laughs> or uh, responding to some uh, um, um, commands uh, by voice and so on. Uh, these approaches are working very well now, yeah. uh, but although algorithms that are, were similar to what we have today were around already from the 80s, but at that time we did not have enough data to train yeah. them, and even if we had the data, it we did available. not have enough computing power right. to deal with that data. So now we have all these ingredients, and so these algorithms, these approaches work very, very well. So, so, so we are a long way, but having said that, and so we can successfully apply AI in many domains, banking is one, but you know, healthcare, transportation, whatever, but we have a long way to go. So like maybe <laughs> we're going from New York to Pennsylvania, <laughs> and, and we're going, trying to go, all, we're in Pennsylvania, we're yeah. going to California. Yeah. So, you said something really big there, the difference between interpretation and understanding, which we'll come yeah. back to. Give us a, a, a quick answer on your job is to worry about the problems caused by everything you just described. So give the room a sense. Let's get right into sort of ethics and responsibility. Yeah, What's I wouldn't keeping say, you up? I wouldn't say there are problems yeah. caused by all these things. I said that, that this is a happen. very powerful and positive technology that yeah. helps human beings make better decisions, more grounded and so on. But we have to be careful that it does not uh, replicate or even uh, um, uh, accelerate uh, issues that are already in human beings. One of them, which is very related to the topic here, is the fact that humans are biased. We have more than 180 kinds of bias in our decision-making process. And so if we are not careful, especially in these data-driven approaches, we run the risk of uh, injecting, even not wanting to do that, injecting this kind of bias into the, for example, by not being too careful about choosing this training data set, which is the set of examples that I mentioned right. before. Then bias can be injected in many other ways, but you know, this is one thing. So it's very important to be able to be aware of this possible injection of bias as to be able to detect it and mitigate it. But right. fortunately, there are a lot of researchers at IBM mm -hmm. and in other places that yeah. can have algorithms to do that. So, so, okay, so I want you to pick up, Rashida, on, I'm sure there's algorithms to do that, but there's also the practical problem. You worked on client implementation of AI at IBM. How, how do you deal with sort of the practical problem um, at a human level of bias going into the system? So, you know, that's a good question. I think, you know, first of all, I think it's really important to understand that AI is a reflection of who we are as individuals, first and foremost. I think second of all, um, you know, these systems are trained by human beings. They are trained by professionals. The data is gathered, the information is gathered and captured by professionals. So, you know, for me, I think on a point that we don't often think about when we think about bias is really ensuring that we inject diversity of thoughts, perspectives, and people in how we gather that information, how we assess the problem. The people that are delivering and implementing these solutions. And a lot of times we forget that because when we normally think about software or implementing software, one plus one typically equals two. And if I bought a software, I flip the switch. But AI technology is different. It requires that augmentation of the individual 
Um, so it's not just about the technology, it's about the technology and the human expertise and how do you infuse those things together. So as you're implementing those solutions, really ensuring that the individuals that are training these solutions you know, are diverse, whether it's race, it is gender, it is thought process, right? Did everyone on that team go to the same university? Is everyone on that team a computer science major, right? Um, probably not a good idea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's great. But I so I think so I think you know really ensuring that you know that perspective you know we have diversity of thoughts perspectives across the board right and really looking at it as you know a circle it's not just diversity in one thing but really diversity in terms of how we think and how we should solve problems you know is really important because I think what AI is doing is AI is surfacing to your point issues and things that were already there. Right, but now it's giving us the ability to see it in fact, see it with data, yeah. but then it allows us to make a much more informed and a much more transparent decision. And potentially the downward consequence, if not sort of thought of at the outset, is with exponential consequences. Yes. So, so um, let me go to you, Sirkan, and ask you, so you spent a dozen years at Facebook. Yeah. How has your perspective, you left, um, you told me you left just before the election of 2016, coincidentally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How has, he really said that, how has your perspective on AI kind of changed? How did it change in your time there, and how has it now changed? Um, I want to tell a story. Yeah. Please. Okay, so um, early on when uh, one of my first jobs at Facebook was running the newsfeed team, and ironically spending a lot of time building ranking algorithms and keeping machine learning and AI away from them. Um, and in that time, uh, one of the other engineers that worked on the team told me this story uh, about a project at Google. So Google has millions of people submitting their resumes, and they have this great data set of you know, which of those people did we grant interviews to? Which of those people uh, did well on interviews? Which of those people got uh, job offers and then accepted them? And even which of those people did well in their careers at Google, worked, uh, you know, worked their way through the level system, et cetera. So this is a great machine learning problem. So they took all the text of all of these resumes, they put them into whatever the algorithm that was state of the art at the time, and they tried to see if they could predict which of these resumes would be people that do well at Google. And the numbers look great. They had this great predictor of success, but uh, they took a little bit of a harder look at, at the algorithm. They asked it, you know, what are the most common factors that, uh, that you're using? The most common negative factor was having some sort of professional accreditation. So if you're like a Microsoft certified engineer or something like that, I was very negative for getting hired at Google for some reason. <laughs> and um, the number one positive feature of a resume that was predictive of getting a job at Google was being named David. And uh, so a lot of different things that we can learn from this story. One is that they didn't implement this, okay? This is not how resumes are screened at Google now because they were able to ask those questions. And we have come a long way uh, since this story was told to me. And current algorithms don't lend themselves quite as easily to asking those questions about what are you looking at? What are the things that you're basing your decision on? Um, B, um, you know, we can think about having a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a dialogue between people and technology. Why is being David so predictive of getting a job at Google? You know, that speaks to a lot of the questions that, that uh, you asked about uncovering some of our own biases and, and understanding um, what, um, what we're doing. And then, um, uh, finally, I think this is something we think about a lot. You know, it's very important. There's this hidden problem with AI. Um, we don't give ourselves enough credit as humans. We're constantly doing all this common sense, discarding theses about what, how the world works. We're constantly mm -hmm. using a pretty sophisticated understanding of the world and you know, ethics to make decisions, even when we don't realize it. And algorithms don't really have that. So there's this sort of like hidden problem where you can do something that looks great, but you expect that it's learning things in the way you would have learned them, and you forget how much common sense and ethics you're bringing to that. And so you have to ask that question. Performance looks great, but you have to dig a little deeper before that becomes something that's making decisions in the real world. Um, Amazing. Thank you. So uh, I didn't answer your question at all, but. <laughs> Good. We're, we're going to 
I'm going to keep poking <laughs> on that. But, but what, you, what you are saying, I want to pick up on David, yeah. and I want to say, you know, Marianne, you run the practice that gives people, I imagine, home loans yeah. um, and helps decide who gets them. Yeah. And you are a client of IBM, and you've implemented AI. How have you ensured that it isn't just people named David getting loans. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I think we're using this very much the augmented approach of AI. So it, the tool that we have and developed within Royal Bank Scotland is an agent assist tool. So actually the contact centre agents are using AI to support them to serve the customers. So effectively they're using the AI as the knowledge bank for them that's allowing them to hold that sort of more human um, conversation and, and we're retaining the human being in terms of the agent but um, the AI is really freeing the agent to actually listen very carefully to the customer's needs and, and to their um, desires and their wants and, and where they are in their current journey so it's a very collaborative approach that we're using and we're using AI to help us also understand just some of that data that we're collating around the calls and the questions and the, the problems that we're getting in terms of where someone's application is getting stuck in the process and, and how we can free that and, and improve the overall customer experience. So we're using data and we're using um, human beings to be augmented with the AI, but really the AI for us is freeing the agent um, to actually deal with the customer. So, so let me go back. This is like a perfect, I'm glad you two are sitting <laughs> next to each other. Um, Rashida, your job is to see that this gets implemented um, responsibly at a client side, do you take us through like what do you have to what what is IBM thinking about and exchanging about with clients as as you're trying to make sure that there's enough sort of human endeavor going into these systems? Well, you know, I'll first say, you know, when I speak to clients, the first thing is what is your business problem? You know, what is your challenge? What are you solving for? Yeah. Because, you know, you know, a lot of times I've found that, you know, when I speak to clients, they say, my CEO or my boss wanted AI. And then I, <laughs> that's what they said. And I said, okay, I'm not necessarily sure what that means. <laughs> so, you know, it's like there's this magic around the technology. It's, it's magical. And yes, the technology can produce what I call magical outcomes, yeah. but it's not magic, right? So it first requires you to be grounded in what are you trying to solve for? What is the problem, right? And then deciding from there, you know, how can, you know, the technology be an aid in you solving your problem? That can be, you know, how can I use AI to, you know, um, remove repetitive tasks and allow my experts to be able to do higher value work? It could be, oh, by the way, I can, you know, use AI to um, for automation purposes, right? And automate and re-engineer my entire process um, end to end. But you don't start there, right? You first start, you know, with what are you trying to solve? Because some problems, as magical as AI can be, some problems are not to be solved with AI, right? They are fantastic analytic solutions that are perfect for a client's business challenge. So we have to be careful that we, you know, we don't overhype, right, the word AI, right? And we really focus on with things that we are trying to solve in our core businesses and leverage the right level of technology to solve it. The right level of technology and frankly you're all saying sort of give the humans an ability to use their higher selves in yeah. the work yeah. as and opposed to be agreed. doing things machines could otherwise yeah. do. And you know, at IBM we believe that's why we use that word augmented intelligence yeah, I because that. I really it, you know, for us, you know, we've seen that there are things that humans, you know, people, experts are going to do well all the time. Yeah. Right? That's great. And there are things that, you know, computers, you know, um, and software will also do very well, right? And sometimes those things cross Right, um, you know, but we need to be able to look at them together. So it's not a, it's not binary, right? And a lot of times we tend to look at it binary. Um, and as we look at it, we do need to think, take away. I call it that binary concept because a lot of times when we're implementing technology in the past, it's always about the IT department or the technology department or the CIO. And with AI technologies, it's about the business process. 
right? And really ensuring that the business owners, the P&L owners, the individuals that own that business process are involved in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, you're getting at a really important endeavor that I think will come up a lot across the next evening and, and day, which is how people break down the traditional silos of business and work more collaboratively with the lateral parts being more important maybe even than, than the hierarchical ones. So um, Francesca, I wanna go back to you and I wanna, you know, we're, we're hearing, this all gives me such a sort of positive sense of where the world is going as it relates to AI, but let's talk about where there needs to be boundaries, boundaries established either legally or, you know, by, by government, by business. How do you see, how do you think that should play out and how do you think um, it will play out? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, there are many, uh, many, a whole range of mechanisms to drive the technology in the, in the right direction, in the most beneficial direction. Uh, you, you can use uh, um, uh, best practices, uh, guidelines, uh, certificates, standards, uh, auditing mechanisms, uh, up to the most uh, 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 enforceable and unflexible one, which are new regulations, of course. But I think that we have to consider the whole range of mechanisms and for different uh, properties that we want to have in the, in the technology, whether it's uh, fairness, so the absence of some form of bias, or uh, uh, robustness, or transparency, or explainability, which I think is very related to what all of you have talked about, you know, whether to I, you want to identify that David is the reason why he's making a decision, or you want to help human beings working with the technology and trust the technology, you need that the property. Explainability is very important to be able for the technology to explain why he's making a certain decision, is making a certain recommendation to the human yeah. being. To so, uh, so for each one of these properties, uh, you may think about you know, what is the, is the right mechanism. Of course, new regulations are only one possibility, uh, which takes a long time to be defined. And then whether it, when it has to be changed because the technology evolves, it takes a long time to change. So, so you have to be very careful in using that mechanism. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I think that the whole uh, range of mechanism, the, 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 the point that is common to all of these mechanisms is that identifying the issues and understanding what's the best solution is something that cannot be done by tech people alone, by AI experts alone, or by policymakers alone. It has to be done in a very multidisciplinary, yeah. a multi-stakeholder uh, approach, meaning that those that produce AI, those that are going to use AI, like the human beings yeah. in uh, uh, RBS or other companies that are going to use it, and those that are going to be impacted by the decisions right. of this team, you months plus machine. So all the voices have to be heard, even for identifying the issue. Because for example, if we stick to the notion of bias and fairness, um, there are many different definitions of fairness, not just one. Yep. And they are more or less appropriate for the different tasks, the different communities, and the different scenarios. So you really have to think, even before starting to design a product and developing, you have to identify what's the right notion of fairness, because otherwise you do the whole, all the work, and then when you're ready to be deployed, you discover that it's not the right notion of yeah. fairness that you want to do. Generally. Right, fairness looks different. You know, fairness is often in the, the eye of the beholder. So <laughs> just, just sticking with the notion, though, of how do we arrive at least at a set of contours for defining um, the ethics, uh, Sirkan, you, you ran a session at our new work mm -hmm. summit, um, which was focused on AI about this. Yeah. And I think your, your group came out and said there needs to be company self-regulation, there needs to be industry regulation, there needs to be government regulation. And that seems to be um, kind of well understood, yeah. but kind of where is it, you know, is that actually happening? Um, no. And if not, why not? <laughs> yeah. um, and I don't think, so you anywhere. did answer my question there. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> no, I, I mean, um, it's really hard to write laws. It's really hard to get laws passed. Yeah. It's really hard to understand AI. Um, and so we're not close, uh, I don't think, to having anything. You know, we have a little bit more of an understanding of what we want out of things like privacy and maybe 
antitrust, but in terms of AI specifically, I, I haven't seen anything that even resembles um, a regulatory approach to it. And that kind of worries me. I, I totally agree with the spectrum uh, perspective. And I think, you know, one thing I think a lot about, and it's probably why we look to the technologists alone by default to tell us how to use these things yeah. safely and to diagnose the problem, is because um, what's really happening is that the technology, AI being one of them, but we can think about it, social networking, lowering the marginal cost of distributing media, that accelerates something or takes something we thought we understood and then pushes it out into an extreme or you know, accelerates it to the point that the way we think about fairness is no longer complete. Yeah. And so, you know, I think about um, I think about that a lot. And so sometimes when we're blaming the technology, the technology has just pushed something into a domain where we have to sit down and redefine what we meant by being fair in this yeah. way. And uh, I think that's really hard for us. I think um, that's happening faster and faster. I like that this is the new rules summit because we need some new rules, yeah. at least to rethink some old rules. And um, you know, and I hope. We are, um, I hope with events like this and just more awareness, um, we're getting to a place where we can sit down and answer those questions. Yeah, so let me actually pick up on, on this. And, yeah. and Marianne and Rashida asked the two of you because a lot of your work is quite close to the humans. On the other side, mm -hmm. your, your past work. Rashida, where are we in the state of the public consciousness? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there, I, I work at a journalism company. We, you know, is there, is there enough journalism about this? Is, are, are there enough things going on in the world to actually make people want to write their congressperson and <laughs> say there needs to be a framework or care about the company they're working with? What, what would each of you say to that? You know, I'll say, I mean, to Francesca's early point, I mean, the topic of AI is not new, right? Um, we've been teaching it in universities and school for decades. Um, but in terms of the consumability and yeah. access to the technology, that's where we've evolved. If I even look at, you know, within IBM, when we, you know, dedicated our, our, our cognitive unit, you know, several years ago, I mean, just how the technology has evolved over the last five or six years, I mean, back then it was you know, a little bit more of a black box. Right, you know, now we have APIs. You can go on the website. You can download it. You can access the technology. You can roll up your sleeves yourselves. Right, you can you know do all these things like you know how was this decision made and you know do things like traceability. We couldn't do that before. So now there's more access to the technology. But I still think we're in the first inning. Right, um, now that we have more access and more consumability, people are touching it more. They're feeling it more. They're getting a better understanding of what it is. But there's still a lot more you know to be done even when we think about implementing AI technology a lot of times the first thing we go to is an interaction a chatbot or customer service and those things are fabulous ways to leverage a technology but they're not the only ways right we need to be able to be extended at how do we get them in the critical our critical business operations you know, in an in a, in a industry like insurance, like underwriting, which is a prized area for you know, the insurance industry, you know, when we you know, look at, okay, how do we significantly transform and you know, reinvent how we do something like underwriting you know, with AI? So I think that you know, that conversation is beginning to happen, but we need to see the technology really implemented at scale you know, in core businesses. And I think it's just a comfort level. Yeah. Right? People are still not yet comfortable, right? Um, so we need to, all of us, right? Um, you know, make, continue to make the, the um, to have awareness on the topic, continue to make the technology more consumable so people can see it in action and where it works and where it doesn't work, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and that will help faster and accelerate adoption. What would you add, Marianne? Yeah, I, th I think for me, we're using AI in a very controlled manner because of all the reasons that we've talked about. Um, we also have in the UK, it's a regulated mortgage market, so we're very heavily governed by regulation. So we're actually using AI to support the agents to, to if you like, 
it strengthens our position. I would imagine, because yeah. Because in, in many ways, you're not just relying on human memory for yeah. how do I answer that inquiry. How do, and you've got an audit trail via the AI tool, which gives you deeper analytics. So so we are at this moment in time just in the infancy. So I think you asked about where we are in the journey. We have just packed the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a really confused <laughs> family on this one. <laughs> but, but, but we're great. using it, you know, to help. And, and I think we're going slow slowly but surely, yeah. because we have to build confidence in our human beings that are using that AI to support them to make the right decisions, yeah. not only for our customers, but for our bank, for, for to protect our, our, our position. So um, I think we've got a hell of a long way to go, but we've got some wonderful partners that we're yeah. working with, mm -hmm. and we're learning. You know, today we've spent lots of time learning from each other, and I think that's the really important bit for me, and to do it in a controlled way. Yeah. Um, and in a conscious way yeah. to, to the points that, that you've made. Um, Francesca, I want to go to you. I want to shift um, the topic a little bit to just the idea of kind of gendered AI. So when <laughs> Watson um, was on Jeopardy, it was with this sort of booming, authoritative male voice. <laughs> and then when you want the blinds drawn at home and you ask um, Alexa, to, I don't know actually if Alexa can do that, but it is not a booming authoritative male voice. Um, it is a supportive female voice, and I think that's the case for Cortana and Siri. So, I mean, you've been at this um, and really helping define AI for the world for a long time. How do, is that, how, how do you see that sort of in the context of bias in AI, and how should we think about that? Well, of course, I mean, each user interface has its own, you know, use cases and uh, people that he can, he has to interact well with. So the, the decisions that are made in that space, again, they should be made not just by the, the technology producers, but should be made with, together with the people that are you going to use the technology yeah. and together with experts of other uh, disciplines like sociologists, psychologists, philosophers that can understand also when the technology is uh, uh, delivered at such a large scale, like in some of these uh, digital assistant or question answering systems, <coughs> what's the impact of using a certain interface, a certain image, a certain uh, look, a certain kind of device in, in delivering at such a large scale. So there has to be also, in the picture and in the discussion, experts that can evaluate and predict the impact of that. So, but having said that, I think that uh, you know the gender, you know, diversity in the technology is really very important, and in general, diversity is very important. Uh, so, teams of developers have to have. Uh, possibly as many points of view, as many people with different backgrounds as possible. Because all the issues that can be can come up in you know, yeah. the developing a system uh, can be more understood if there are, or more even raised and identified if there are people with different experiences and different background. Um, but another thing that I think that uh, women involved heavily in the uh, uh, definition and the delivery of this technology is that, as I said before, the approach that one needs to use to address and identify the issue is a very open, collaborative, and multidisciplinary yeah. approach. And as you know, I believe that women are especially good at this, <laughs> this at doing this. So, so that's why, I mean, I'm not saying that men are not, <laughs> but... You know, Sorry. He's with but, us today. Yeah, yeah. with us, yeah. But I'm saying that women can bring also uh, special, you know, examples in that space. Yeah. Let me actually, let, let's shift for a moment to the sort of softer yeah. tissue um, stuff that we've all been kind of getting around the edges on. Um, it, it, let, let's talk about that. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you, Sir Khan, and, and I'll ask both of you, um, where have you seen um, sort of new things required of collaborative work and where does actually having more women at the table just feel so obvious and where, where is it still hard? Women are people of all different backgrounds. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, um, I did a lot of work prior to working in AI research at Facebook. Um, you know, I started our office here in New York, and um, 
we did a lot of work uh, making sure our culture was welcoming to women, uh, making sure we were doing the things that are required to have a diverse workforce, and that's you know in recruiting, um, in the events that that we did. I mean, it's just a lot of energy that goes into that, and it's really rewarding. And I was really proud of the progress that we made, even though it wasn't perfect in diversity at, at Facebook in general. It did feel like when I joined an AI research group, I was going a little bit back in time. So I, I do think, like particularly if you get because to, everyone was a man. Yeah, there was there was just more. You know, people start PhDs uh, a lot earlier, and that world is a lot more insular and you know I don't think it's you know I think uh, I don't have the numbers but I think if you look at the number of PhDs granted in machine learning and computer science you're going to see that 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 part of the industry is behind where we've all come yeah. in terms of diversity um, and then yeah I'll, I'll leave it there and let yeah um, Rashida I want to ask you we d we did a um, we call we did a call just to get to know one another a little bit in advance and you made a comment to me, you know, I'm kind of the triple threat. Um, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm young, I'm certainly much younger than me, um, and, and I am, um, I'm African American, and I, you know, that's all there when I show up. What's that experience been like at a tech company, working specifically in AI, and sort of deep in? You know, so one of the things I'll say is interesting that you said that, you know, you fell back into time because I just think we haven't progressed on the topic, right? So if I look back, I you know, you know, 20 plus years ago when I was in university, I was, you know, one of maybe three black women, right? When I looked at, when I went and got my MBA, I was one black woman, right? When I, um, you know, walk into a room, whether it's at my clients or, you know, at my company, um, I'm typically the only person in the room. So I have experienced that for over 20 years. And I haven't seen it change. And it is hard because it's very uncomfortable, right? Um, you know, when I, when I typically, when I walk in the room as a black woman, one of the first things I do is I size up the room. Yeah. And how do I size it up? I count to see how many other people look like me. Yep. Right? If there's enough, or at least a handful, I say, whew, right? Okay. If not, I brace myself. Okay, can I be truly authentic? Can I be myself? Or, you know, do I have to be that other Rashida? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So I think one of the things about AI is that I think AI gives us the ability to really address this issue from a very factual perspective to ensure that we're really addressing the root cause and the problem. Right, which I still believe is around recruiting, you know, and retention. And we've got to be able to say we can't find the resources, we can't find women, we can't find, you know, black women, we can't find Hispanic women. Come on, yes, we can. Oh, sure, we can. <laughs> and AI go to can the help places us. where they right. are. Right. Right? right. I mean, I'm from the U.S. Virgin Islands, 32 square miles. I mean, you know, IBM found me some way, somehow. Yeah. Yep. So. <laughs> So we can be found. So I think that I think that you know this is a topic that makes us all uncomfortable, you know, a yep. lot, and we don't like to really deal with the issue head on. And I think that it's now the opportunity to do so. And yeah. AI technology allows us to do that in a way where it's not emotional. We have the data, we have the information, we can explain it, we have the traceability, and we should be charging. We should hold our corporation, the enterprises that we work for, our leaders, our CEOs, we should hold them accountable to help us accelerate this topic. I love it. I, I mean, that, that is a big idea that AI is the key, or at least one of the most important keys to progress on something that is fundamentally human. I, I love that. Francesca, give us a little color about your experience um, as a woman sort of at the center of, you know, this crazy important technology for your whole career? Well, I mean, I've been, uh, I joined IBM uh, just less than four years ago, and before I was in academia for like 25 yep. years. And of course, in academia, it's not that different. I think it's even worse. I mean, yeah. compared to my environment at IBM, you know, uh, where, you know, many, many uh, leaders are women, even starting from our CEO. Uh, and in academia, I think even now, uh, I think that 80% uh, of the uh, AI professors are male. Yeah. Uh, so 
But fortunately, I see a lot of initiatives at all the scientific conferences around AI for women and also other minorities that, uh, you know, that are more and more prominent at, uh, you know, uh, ICML or New RIPS or HKI, Triple AI, whatever. So, so, for example, next year, actually, there will be Triple AI, which is one of the main AI conferences here in New York, what Midtown. Triple AI Triple because it's AI. Ad, uh, the Association for the Advancement of AI. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's a conference that is every year uh, in North America. Uh, so next year we'll be here in New York and we will have a chair just in charge of all thinking about what are the possible initiatives for including and supporting women and all the other minorities. Um, and so that, that I see a lot of initiative in the scientific environment, but also at IBM and in other corporations I see a lot of initiative. IBM has programs just dedicated to helping women and supporting women. The Elevate program is to help women uh, grow in the company and get promoted and get trained to be is more easily promoted to more senior levels. The tech re-entry program is for women at the mid-career level that uh, had to go out of their job because they took, took a pause because they, have, they had a child or, or any other reason and then they get uh, uh, trained for 12 weeks into science, engineering, technology and at the end they get uh, an offer for a full-time employment and this works really well. So I think the corporation are really understanding that uh, by supporting women yeah. with a little bit of resources, they get a lot more in return by having these women uh, in, into the workforce. So, so I love hearing that and what that does is sort of paint a picture of a leadership team at IBM five, seven, 10, 12 years from now that looks even more, I, IBM does have a woman CEO, yeah. so um, bravo, um, <laughs> but that looks even more, more equal and a body of work that looks um, even more equal. And that brings me to one more question I wanna ask you, Maryam, and then I wanna go to the group. So think of your, your questions now um, for this, um, this incredible panel. And that is, so you're, you're, um, you're in a business yeah. um, where AI is transforming this thing this company has done for 300 years. <laughs> um, take us to, you know, like 2030. Um, where, where are we then? What, what are we able to do sort of in your business um, then um, or in the world that just can't be done today because of AI? So I think, I, I think AI will propel us forward to, the, to that junction. So ideally, we want to allow the customers to transact with us in a way that suits them, as yep. opposed to a traditional bank forcing the customer to follow the journey that we want them to follow. It's all about the customer. So actually, for us to transfer and to, to take our model our business model and absolutely re-engineer it to the, to the customer's needs then I think AI is going to be with us all that way and it's going to support us whether it be with automation and digitalization of our customer experience but actually to create a frictionless customer journey but they can transact with us whether they want to come into one of our branches on the high street or whether they actually want to digitally converse with us or whether they want to speak to a human we can provide that augmented service whatever the customer wants. I think all too often in British banking it's been about the, what the banker wants as opposed to what the customer wants yep. and that ain't going to work going forward. That's in banking everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Not, yeah. not just in Britain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I think I think AI will, uh, the data analytics will help us propel forward and understand what our customers needs really are. It's great and one more quick one Sirkan because you've set up a company now yep. um, that Spell which is meant <clears throat> to make AI more accessible, so yes. take us 10 years out. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think like your earlier question was about where we are driving New York to Miami yeah. in, um, in California. AI. To California, <laughs> right. Um, so even farther, a journey. And I think um, on the research side, we've come a really long way. But yeah. on the um, how these things that we've demonstrated we can do in research, are impacting, are being turned into products and things yeah. that we use, I think we're a lot earlier. And that's where I think Spell comes in, is um, what we're trying to do is empower companies that understand their industries, that understand their, their uh, products, 
better than we do, is give them the same tools that made AI successful at a company like a Facebook or a Google so that they can build the future themselves. Yeah. And, um, and I think moving this like really great technology into everyone's hands is also what I want to do is um, you know, facilitate having a better conversation because okay. more people have this sort of tactile experience, actually building something, yeah. using tools to, to deploy something with AI and see how it can affect their lives. Maybe they'll be um, you know, a little bit more informed when they call their congressman or, or something like yeah. that. So. And we got the, I'm sorry, I just have to hear from you, Rashida, on this too, because we got the what does IBM look like in a decade on a human level. What does the work of AI look like in a decade? Um, I, first of all, I agree with my, my friends to the left and right of me. I, I think, I don't think we know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, great. Um, I, I, I really don't think that we know. And, and I think that's a good thing because I think the possibilities really are endless. Um, but it will transform how we do the work that we do today. Yeah. And, you know, a, a lot of times, a lot of times people are afraid of that and we shouldn't be. Right? We shouldn't be. We should really embrace the technology. And I tell a lot of companies, look, start out. It's not about the big big bang, right? It's not about you transform your entire business, you know, of thousands of people today, but take it in pieces, just like you say, right? I park the car, right? You know, park the car, turn on the engine, right? And you know, see what happens. Um, because that's how you learn, that's how you iterate, and that's how you can get a feel for exactly what those possibilities are. But I really don't think that we know. It's amazing. It's pretty inspiring. Questions from the room for these four folks. Yes, I saw the first hand up with the pen. <laughs> and uh, just say who you are and where, which, who, what you're representing. Hi, uh, my name's Peggy Siegel. I work at Hunter College. I help um, college students um, find their careers after college. And it's a very diverse student population at Hunter College. So my question is really, um, partly sort of almost from the recruiting, you know, inclusive side of things. Um, looking at AI, um, I think it's a combination of being reflective of who we already are and then trying to push us forward into who we might be. And so I, I guess my question is, how much, um, where do you think we are on that? I mean, to the point, I think Sircon was raising this issue of sort of looking at training a certain way. We're looking for people with PhDs, but Francesca mentioned the reentry program, so that's another way of providing people with the skills they need that's a different credentialing. So, so the question is, where do you think we are on the spectrum of just reflecting where we already are versus pushing us to do something new on, specifically on the sort of diversity recruiting front? Um, I'll take a stab at this. Early when, um, early when we started our company, we did not go out to academia and hire people uh, from, with a research background. There aren't that many people with PhDs in machine learning or AI. And instead, we hired you know, traditional software engineers. And our thesis was that in the future, AI and machine learning are going to be something that every person who considers themselves a software developer or engineer does. And actually, what I've seen, we had somebody that came to one of our learning groups and was building, this is really inspiring, was building um, a sort of speech recognizer for his sister who was, uh, who was blind and wanted to do specific things around the house and thought it was a fun project. And that person was like helping everybody else in our class. We go through some of this online curriculum that you can find. And, um, and he had only learned to write Python three months before coming to this coursework and doing this curriculum that he found on online. So um, I think particularly as deep learning, which is kind of the emphasis um, of a lot of AI right now, is a pretty young field, I think it's a phenomenal opportunity for people to work in a really fast growing new industry with much less traditional education, much, much, much less reliance on, um, on universities and degrees than, than we realize. And, and I really yeah, want to see so that play out. For example, at IBM, we have a program called P-TECH that helps uh, young people uh, to n n that not necessarily have to go through the four-year degree, but to get the right skills to be part, uh, active part of this, uh, you know, revolution of the marketplace uh, done by AI. Of course, we also have PhDs in, in research and so on, but we also want to help young people to get the right skills and as well as retraining our own developers, of course, yeah. because they need to be retrained to understand what it means to uh, develop and design an AI system rather than a traditional you know, mm -hmm. software. 
-hmm. I know we had a lot of hands up, but I, I want to make one point on this Please. question. Is um, I, didn't, I think it's important for us to really understand that a lot of bias exists. And I'll give you this example. I had an employee a couple years ago that was hiring on the team. And when I looked at the list of people that they had, they all looked alike. Very similar experience. You know, very, everything was very similar. And I said to this individual, you are not going to extend an offer. And they were extremely upset with me. And I said, you did not go out to a diverse population. Yep. I am not saying that the people are not qualified for this job and they're not fabulous, but you have to show me that you weren't biased and you yeah. were, right? So, and this person didn't even, they, didn't, they weren't even looking at it from that lens, right? And they were upset with me, right? And I just had to have a very open conversation and be able to say, I agree with the credentials, but you've got to show me that you have extended your octopus legs. And sometimes we don't even, you know, realize it, right? So I think that's something a lot of times which we don't think about. And I think we have to heighten our senses to say totally. that we, we are biased. So how do we implement tools? How do we use AI, you know, to be able to help that? At IBM, we actually just, you know, we have a tool where we've implemented where as a manager, when you're hiring for a position before you can extend an offer, it'll go out, you know, to a population and say, have you considered, you know, for this, for what the skill sets that you're looking for, or these are the top 10 candidates that are out there. Go talk to their managers and see if they're available, right, you know, or not. And these are people most of the times you would not have even thought of, you don't even know them, it's they great. weren't even on your radar. Amazing. I think we had a, whoa. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna buy us to the back of the room. Yes, yeah, right in the middle, right in the middle. Right, right, yep, by the post. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Zara Cass. I'm a doctor uh, in New York, actually. So I actually came into this worried a little bit about AI and the bias of the coders in healthcare, so the electronic medical record. What would happen if all the coders are white men? How would that algorithm affect the electronic medical record as it affects patients? But I'm kind of more fascinated with what you said, which is that the bias that patients face could be neutralized by AI. So for example, like the mortality we're facing with black women and like maternal mortality, could that actually be neutralized if their chief complaints were being put into a system and a pop-up says, hey, have you thought about a clot in the lungs? Which we know they are not thought of high, like you know, at the top of the level. So I guess my question is, how could we use AI for good in neutralizing the bias that patients face within the electronic medical record? Like, do you think that's a real possibility? Either of you. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think that the vision, as uh, also Rachida said, the vision is in general, whether it's healthcare or other domains, mm -hmm. is that these once we in embed the right values and fairness and the right notion of fairness, for example, into an AI system, then this AI system who is supporting some human being make, who is going to make a decision, like a hiring manager or a doctor or whatever, then can serve also as an alert system to alert whether the human beings is maybe doing something that is not diverse enough is choosing a, a slate of candidates that is not uh, you know uh, di different enough in, in in all the features of the candidates so and so the uh, alert part is really part of this vision that AI we can be careful and detecting and mitigate the bias in the AI system but then we get back that the AI system can help us being less biased, and so that's the vision of and this you know uh, circle that we we have in mind. And I'm going to take the last question right here in the front. <laughs> uh, my name is Erica James. I'm at, I'm in academia. I'm the dean of a business school, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is understand how to preempt some of the challenges associated with the AI that many of you have talked about on the panel, and in particular expose students as they're learning how to do and implement and create this technology also about the those challenges are is there a an academic discipline and francesca maybe this is for you having come from academia is there a discipline in data ethics that mm. exists where there are faculty who are working with students about the ethical side of this well, there are many courses that are popping up in various universities all over the world that uh, expose uh, 
uh, students studying technology to this ethical uh, consideration, like, I don't know, MIT as a course on AI ethics and governance uh, together with Harvard, uh, they're doing it together, or uh, you know, m many, many different ones. I think the Carnegie Mellon is another one. So you find it uh, popping up, uh, and, and that's very important. And of course, it should be done uh, y by uh, faculty, in these uh, different uh, possibly uh, departments uh, because you also want experts. I mean, I talk about AI ethics and I read a lot about AI ethics, but my background is AI, you know? So I need, if I were to teach a course, I would like to also have somebody whose background is ethics and is interested into the relationship between ethics and AI. So the other, you know, uh, approach. But I think that uh, I see more and more, you know, these courses popping up which is very important for the education. Because one thing that we didn't talk to in the panel is that educational uh, um, initiatives are very important for students, for media, for policy makers, totally. for yeah. developers, you know, being aware of where the technology <coughs> is. Uh, not thinking that the technology has gone all the way to California yeah. from here to there. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's not at the beginning, it's not at the end, but, but where it is. What are the real capabilities and limitations of the technology? What are the challenges that await us? Like uh, you mentioned, you know, the common sense reasoning. This is a big challenge. How, yeah. how we make sure that uh, AI can understand understand how the world functions, because if it doesn't understand it, then yes, it can be very successful in very narrow domains, but once you need something more, yeah. uh, we use a lot of common sense reasoning in interacting between human beings. So that's a one big challenge, and there are many others, and it's important that everybody is aware of where we are right now. To me, I mean, what a, what a great um, note to, to end on that sort of education because of the complexity of all this is such a requirement the whole way through on every level, the practitioners, the business operators implementing and just the public at large. So that, that can be well understood. Um, so let me just take a minute. Um, I want to say to all of you, I believe cocktails start now. Someone at my, on my team will vigorously, yes, I got a thumbs up, which means um, all of those other questions, please come. Um, first, let them have a drink, but please uh, come ask. Um, I expected this to be a, a great conversation. And, and I heard just a handful of things that I think we should send the group out with. Rashida gave us um, that AI is simply a reflection of who we are as human beings, who we already are. And then someone said, I think it might have even been um, the, the woman who asked the first question, and who we might be, which I loved. Uh, being named David shouldn't be why you get a job <laughs> anywhere. Um, and I love Sir Khan. I'm going to go away thinking about the notion that we don't give ourselves enough credit. Um, Francesca said that too. She, she just did for how we process as humans, um, which really gets at this notion that um, it is as much a human endeavor as anything else. Rashida gave us it's, it's not a binary thing. No single team, no single function, um, no human or machine alone is going to make AI work or be more inclusive. Um, and then I love the idea that the way we think about fairness is no longer complete. I think the final and the last word um, goes to Rashida and I think sets us off onto the evening and day tomorrow that we'll have, which is that we have simply haven't progressed enough on, on the topic. And to the question that was asked by the physician in the room, who I think was with us last year, <laughs> if we imagine AI as a tool to actually enable diversity and inclusion, we can find everyone we need for an inclusive team. So with that, Francesca, Sirkan, Rashida, and Marianne, thank you. Thanks to all of you. <laughs>